You're listening to MJCF Presents Abolish, a conversational series uncovering truths from the Family Regulation System, a.k.a. Child Protective Services. My name is MJ. Let's jump right in. Hi, welcome. Welcome to this amazing conversation. I have this wonderful guest, Jason Lester, that I've known for a couple of years now. We became a really close friend and advocate in the child welfare system and in just the um, African-American community in general here in Denver, Colorado. So I wanted to bring him in to have a conversation about blackness, anti-blackness and white supremacy in the child welfare system. And how do you handle or how did you handle white supremacy in the child welfare system as a black man? So, Jason, tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do. Give me some history. Oh, man. I guess I got to always say I'm straight up Jason Lester from Decatur, Georgia. There we go. The east side. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I am a proud social worker. um, And, you know, I've had the privilege of working in child welfare, working in homelessness, working in mental health, yeah. and now I like adjunct teach at DU. DU? Uh, and it's Shout just out. been, you know, a beautiful ride. Yeah. Um, and in this, I've had the privilege of meeting great, phenomenal people like yourself. You are a woman, a human that says the things that everybody is thinking, but just may not be courageous enough to say. Mm-hmm. So I know that oftentimes you may have a few targets on your back, but on behalf of all of us (laughs) that have the pleasure of beholding you, we appreciate you. We love you, and we want you to continue to do whatever it is that you see fit, because you may not see it now. You are a whole leader. And I think that it's never popular when you're going through it and doing something unique. It only becomes popular once the masses start to buy into it. Yeah. And right now, we're not there yet. Oh, we're getting but there. I can tell you that soon a huge shift, a phenomenon is going to happen. And then you're going to be the person along with your entourage are going to be the people, and I'm proud to be an entourage, we are are going to be there to celebrate the success and the work that has been done. So I just want to say that I'm Jason, I'm your friend, I'm honored to be here. (laughs) So we're going to have this conversation about blackness, and you know what, let's just talk about it, because, you know, I imagine that this will get out to a lot of people, and I think that they'll watch it, and then I think they'll have a greater understanding of what it means to be uh, anti-racist. So we had crossed paths because you were, well, you were a caseworker at the Department of Human Services in Denver County, I believe, first. Supervisor down here. Supervisor Mm -hmm. there as well. And then we started working on the case in Arapahoe County. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is, Arapahoe County is the most diverse county. Yes, it is. In Um, Colorado right now. Yeah, in Colorado. And and I use diverse eh, because... When I think of diversity, I think of diversity as in every level of success in diverse. So I don't think of just black and brown people living in an area. I think of the success of people in an area as diverse. So I use quotations because I believe the black and brown community is captured in the child welfare system in Arapahoe County. For some reason, white America gets that misunderstood with the idea of what diversity truly is. Um, but we had crossed paths, and I remember we were working this case, and it, and it was a bit of a, of a difficult case, mainly because it's a black and brown family, right? It's a family that, that looks like us. It's a family of people that, you know, we could relate to, uh, that could be people of our family and yeah, so forth. Is. Exactly, yeah. so easily. And I felt so alone mm-hmm. in doing that work, and I felt so alone and being a clinical consultant with Parents Council, you've been the supervisor for, for the Department of Human Services. But after you had left, um, and after I started removing myself from the child protection work, even though um, I currently still work in the field as a social worker with the Gardner Lightham's office, as well as Parents Council attorney, um, I'm able to see a lot more clearer. Mm. And you and I have reconnected because I was looking for resources for one of my families. And then 
You wonderfully uh, became the director of the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Family Support Services. The Family Support Services mm-hmm. sector. Um, and I remember I said, I'm really happy to see you, but I want to ask you a question, and I want you to take it from there. <laughs> so we reconnected, and you were like, um, look, man, at that meeting, I need to know were you on my side? Something I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. No, you're right. Uh, but I think that's what you said. And that like that was your total thesis statement. And I was like, okay, oh, well, we're going there. Like out the gate. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And I wanted you to know that I very much so was on your side. And I think that what happens with people that are tokenized, yeah. um, I think that they are in survival mode. And they basically, i.e. they being me, at times, at that time in my life, it was all about survival. Of course. And I think that what I, as I mentioned earlier, you you say the things that we totally be agreeing about, but we are too scared to say. That was one of those situations. Everything you said, I'm in my head cheering, we going to do the wave, having a good time. (laughs) It's like, woo, yeah. And I think that, you know, we started off. Like, you know, the older I get, I think that I'm starting to become a little bit more radical, uh, less pacified, and I think that, this is sad, but black people have to get the permission to be black, and that permission comes from within. It doesn't come from that community, it doesn't come from your parents, it comes from within. You have to finally look at yourself and say, I... And proud of who I am. Absolutely. I'm proud of the legacy that my family has. And I'm going to go out here and I'm going to do something. Yes. And I think now, you know, once you get on that train, that train is unstoppable. So when I met you, when we reconnected and you brought that to my attention, honestly, the thoughts in my head was, wow, that was really, uh, that really affected her. And if I would have known how you felt, I would have said something then. I would ask you to come back to my office yeah. and tell you why I made the decisions that I've made. Also, those meetings were recorded. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they had, didn't realize Yeah, that. right. They were, they were recorded. And there were people that were listening in the background. And I think that like the power structures at the time were just um, mm, yeah. vicious. Absolutely. You know? And I think that you feel like you're a puppet. Uh, and basically the puppeteer... Uh, is there, you know, making sure that you uh, go and act as, acor- as, as, as accordingly as to how you're supposed to be acting. Absolutely. And and I did not realize that because I have had the privilege to always do my own thing. So as a as an independent contractor, clinical consultant, I'm a social worker, but I'm a social worker that works independently and I just do contracts with different individuals. I don't work in a structure format any longer. Um and I didn't realize how much of a blessing that that was. I want to talk a little bit more about what was your role as a social worker, as a caseworker? Because a social worker is our degree, but the caseworker is your job title. Oh, yeah. And a caseworker and a caseworker supervisor. And I want to talk about what did it, did it ever sit well with your soul to do the work that you did? Yeah. You know, I, I guess I got to go back. Uh, sure. Because, like, when my uh, mother died in 99, my dad had died in 1990, at the time, my sister and I, we were just, you know, she was 10 years older than me. I was like, you ain't my mama. You know, you ain't going to shout out to Elizabeth. I know you watch watching. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you're not my mom and all this, that, and the other. And, you know, I ended up, well, if you fast forward to 2021, it's called Kinship Care. Yes. And shout out to Jackie Coleman, Leroy Coleman, Ryan Coleman, and Brandon Coleman. They took me in. And, you know, they, I mean, talk about equity, inclusion, and all that. I mean, that was, like, the first time that I got to experience, like, totally, like, wow, I am accepted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she made sure that I graduated from high school with my 1.67 GPA. And she made sure that I went to all the auditions to play in a marching band. And she gave me, like, just, you know, she wanted me to go to Tennessee State because that's where Ryan went. But I was like, oh, no, I'm going to Alabama A&M because, in my opinion, they had a good band. I didn't know what I was going to major in. My mom majored in sociology. I said, it's good for her. It's good enough for me. So I, you know, and I just totally majored in it. Graduated in four years. And then, you know, I got my first master's degree in human development and family studies. And then I moved out here in Colorado. Got a job over the phone. And I worked child support for a little bit, but I really wanted to be a caseworker in Arapahoe County. And, yeah, and at the time, in 
2000 and I think nine. Mm -hmm. There was this guy. His name's Mike DeGretto. He hired me, and I was the only. I hate to say this, but I was the only black man on in that whole arena when it came to child welfare in Arapahoe County. And I mean, there was one other brother that was over in resources, but you know, he had a different role than I did because I was more front facing, and I was working directly with families, children, youth, and families. So you know, my experience being in that role was rewarding. And I like to think that I was the LeBron James of caseworkers. <laughs> Nobody could do it like me. Even on my LinkedIn page in my earlier years, I said, I'm a LeBron James of social work, oh. you know, because I really had that passion and I just fell in love with the work. And, you know, I was able to, I was supported at weekly supervision with Mike. And, you know, Mike, even when he was doing his own work, if he had a question about race, he always asked about that. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated that because I just felt supported. And I think that I learned a lot from him. He learned a lot from me. So that was like my first introduction into working in Arapahoe County. And it was a rewarding experience. Now, I had a lot of cases. <laughs> I had, you know, all the time it, it seemed like I would have like, you know, the, the that you know, that black child that is, you know, on the verge of being committed Absolutely. and, you know, we need to do something. Yes. And I'm pleased to say that when in that situation, if that kid, if that child could not develop a rapport with anybody, I was able to develop a rapport with that child. Yeah. Some kids did very well. And then unfortunately, some did not do very well. But shout out to those kids that overcame the crucibles, took what they were hearing from me and a whole lot of other people mm -hmm. and turned it around and wound up doing something positive. You know, one of, one of my former kids, I like, they're not the adults now, I'm 38 yeah. years old, but one of my kids is a straight up police officer now. Yeah. He could, you know, I would pull off of my Mustang in a minute and he could pull me over and like, <laughs> got your back. But so all I'm saying is, is that at that time period, I was doing the work and I did not realize like the systems that kept our families involved in it in the first yes. place. Yes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. you know, you know, you, you're just going through the motions. Yeah. So let me just, okay, fast forward. So then I fell in love with adoption. Um, and I noticed that black and brown kids were still totally languishing in foster care. Yeah. And they were emancipating to what? The streets. Almost to yes. going back to the same house where they were severely yeah. abused and or neglected or mm -hmm. experienced a lot of trauma. And I was like, man, you know, I, I did the uh, adoption uh, competency certificate at the University of Denver. Oh. And I got that, and I was like, okay, I totally want to get into adoption. Denver Human Services had a, an adoption uh, training recruitment uh, position open, and I jumped at it. Oh. And after four interviews, I wound up getting a job. And this was like the most rewarding part of my career because then I was able to put action behind the things that I believed in. I believed in equity. I believed that there need to be more black and brown people at the table. If you ain't on the table, you on the menu. I'm sure you've heard that. And I mean, essentially what happened was we were able to recruit more black and brown people, more people that spoke the language of our kids, that understood the nice. culture of our kids. And, you know, one of the most traumatizing things that I saw was there was this beautiful black girl. And she was in this foster home with a family that didn't understand her culture. Absolutely. And, you know, she had to get her hair done because we were trying to take pictures for uh, Wednesday's child. That's like, you know, to get people kids the waiting adopted. child. And, yeah. they, and, and they gave her a buzz cut. <laughs> and I was like, no, oh no, no. Gosh. We've got to do something. We've got to ensure that we have a, a cultural training and we need to get folks on board and understand our kids Absolutely. and the cultural needs of our kids. So also with that, we recognize that we needed to, like, get more LGBTQIA folks involved, mm. you know? So we were like, we got to do all this testing and, you know, shout out to the team back in the day. We launched the first LGBT support group in the Denver. Wow. Uh, yeah, for foster parents um, and Denver Human Services. And, you know, it got to be so good, Malika, that we were just like, well, we're rocking and rolling. And then, you know, it got the attention of the state. The state would come and support us with our recruitment events. Nice. And we kind of created this uh, consortium of, like private, like uh, CPAs and county departments coming together to recruit families and stuff. Mm -hmm. Then I got, you know, recruited to go work at the State Department of Human Services and be the permanency manager for all 64 counties. Wow. And it worked out well during that time period. You know, I think that I could, looking back, I could have did a whole lot of things different, but I was sure. kind of young. Now if I got that role, I'd be the LeBron James. <laughs> but I mentioned all that to say that 
I think that I was going through the motions. And I wish that I would have been a little bit more outspoken and possibly created preventative measures to stop families from penetrating the child welfare system to begin with. You know, one of my amazing colleagues, shout out to Jay Mac, uh, Joyce McMillan up in New York, and she said this, and it hit my core, and she said, foster care is nothing but prereq to prison. Ooh. That's what I said. Ooh. Oh my gosh. I, when I first got this job, I was also very young. And I started off uh, working as a um, preservation therapist, so to keep families together. So anyone that's on the verge of having a dependency neglect case and families on the verge to try to like keep this unit together. So my entire lens has always been TPR, termination of parental responsibilities, is the death penalty of families, the death penalty of communities. Yeah. Um, so that's been my foundation and that has been my core. From that... I realized that the people that were training had no cultural respect. And in our organization, we don't use we don't use competency because we we know that's just a check mark for for yes. white America. Yeah, yeah. So we use respect because respect is acknowledgement. Yes. You don't even acknowledge that this family is different. Mm -hmm. Um so I realized that the people that were training me had no cultural respect. So I'm doing this work and kind of like you said, we we're just going through the motions. Yeah. And then you start drowning with cases mm -hmm. and drowning with families. Right. And then you just try to survive mm -hmm. the microaggressions in oh, the offices. Yeah. Um, I really, uh, shout out to Dr. Monte Cooper out in LA. Um, he's the one that changed my entire mindset about being an activist in the child welfare system. And I remember when I met him um, and he said, what work do you do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm in child welfare. I'm a clinical consultant. I fight for families. I fight for parents. I fight for kids. And he says, so you, you uphold white supremacy. Oh. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm black. Um, I'm native American. I'm a survivor of the system. And he said, and I will never forget this. He said, if you are not actively dismantling the system, then you are actively holding it up. Mm. And I said, done. I said, you only need to tell me Life once. changing. Life changing. And I said, <laughs> okay. So everyone, that if you're not actively, if you know that it's racist, and if you don't know that it's racist and you are a professional in the child welfare system and you don't know that it's racist, leave the field, leave the community. This is not for you. This is not for you. But for those who know that it is, what are we doing? What are we doing? Oh. I did not realize how much that I've internalized anti-blackness. We internalize anti-blackness on multiple levels. We do it by education. Colleague of a social work, social worker up in New York has said this. I think this was like the NASW uh, New York chapter. And he said, higher education is nothing but the academic plantation for people of color. Mm -hmm. Uh, these people, y'all, shout out to New York. Y'all hit my soul <laughs> with, with these with these one-liners. Um, and I said, you're right. We have, the reason why, and, and you already have your doctor. You oh, already yeah. have your DSW, oh, yeah. your doctorate in social work. That is absolutely yeah. incredible. I'm currently in school yes, for my are. PhD in international oh, psychology. Oh. My education has nothing to do with me liking to be in that space Ain't of education. Something? At all, right. at all. It has everything to do with me saying, no white person will ever be able to have a higher degree than me. Mm. Because the ones that are on the same level as me treat me as beneath them. Wow. So I have to go back to school to get a higher degree. So that's, that's the only reason why I'm doing this. And it is very true, it is the academic plantation. It does not necessarily teach us how to dismantle racism. It does not teach us how to do that. How are we in an entire institution of higher ed that does not teach us how to be better? Mm -hmm. So I feel some type of way about higher ed, but I do love that we both teach at the University of Denver yeah. Graduate Shout School of Social you. Work. Yeah. Shout out to DU. Yeah. Yeah. DU is changing their culture mm -hmm. in the field of social work. Yes. Um, and I'm happy to see that because I'm asking for reparations. I'm coming for all these institutions. I'm asking for reparations. What reparations in the child welfare community looks like is we need full ride scholarships for black and brown students to be social workers because white people and, and white students have literally dismantled and destroyed our system. 
and these educational plantations are the slave owners. Mm. Mm. They're the slave owners that put people out, right? So when I went back to school for higher ed, I realized that I started doing my own thing and start really understanding the anti-blackness that that is in us whenever we work in the child welfare system. And what that looks like is, you know how as a as a as a black professional, you get all of those cases. <laughs> yeah. Anyone that's a little <laughs> difficult to deal with, anyone that raises their voice, yeah. anyone that is angry because I don't know, you took their children away. Oh my gosh, how dare us? How dare us, as in myself included, try to hush them from their pain and hush them from them being marginalized and hush them because of their oppression. Shame on me for doing that for years and then being proud of myself to say, I can handle those families. Yeah. Bring me in. Oh my God. What happens when those families become your family? Because I have family. to share. I just, I, I, the most, I think you, when it, when it hits you in the face yeah. is when you realize, oh my God, this is what it really looks like. And this is what I'm doing. Yeah, I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this for as long as I live, the lowest I felt. Oh and I'm going to share it. Please. The truth of the matter is, is that one night, my wife and I were in bed, and we heard Ellington, our son, coughing. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we were brand new parents. Neither one of us had had kids before. And that croup cough, oof, it, you... You know what I'm talking about. Yes. That croup cough is something serious. Oh it gosh. will scare oh my gosh. anyone yeah. that has not heard it before. And at the time, we were freaking out. Yeah. And we left the home at, like, I want to say it must have been 1 a.m. in the morning time. Wow. And the first clue was, oh, I better grab my badge. I better grab my human services badge that says Denver County. I never and my wife that. said, oh. I better get my Arapahoe County badge because we don't want to encounter anything. So here we are utilizing our privilege. Mm. Let's just call it what it is. Of course. To not be like those other clients, the people that don't have that badge that yeah. allows for them to get access. So we get there and we say, hi, we have this young man and uh, we, you know, we're, he's coughing. It sounds so scary. And they're like, okay, cool. Come on back, you know, and, you know, we get, you know, put him into the room. And the nurse gets in there, Malika, and she pulls up Ellington's uh, shirt, you know, to try to understand what's going on. And Ellington, at the time, had Mongolian marks. Of course. Everybody that's worked with black kids understand that you're going to have Mongolian marks. Yeah. The nurse at, at the time at Children's Hospital said, um, has anyone abused this child? Uh, we see marks. And I was like, no, he has Mongolian marks, and here's my badge. I'm a supervisor at Denver Human Services, and my wife pulls out her badge, and I am a links facilitator at Arapahoe County Department of Human Services. We love our child, and we would never harm our child. And to leave that hospital disgusting. feeling so low, because what would have happened if we wouldn't have had those doggone badges? And why the hell did we grab the badges to in the first place? That's so subconsciously. We, we knew that it was going to be a racist yes. experience that we could possibly happen, and we grabbed that badge to try and combat that. So it gets worse. While I was in Denver County and my wife was in Arapahoe County, you know, I sometimes when I was in this, this is like 2014. Mm. First thing we do is go on Facebook <laughs> and be like, mm. you won't believe what me and my wife just experienced yeah. at Children's Hospital, and. A whole bunch, a whole bunch of social workers, black ones, white ones, a Asian, a anybody yeah. was talking about. Oh my God, yeah, we had this experience. We had this experience. There was this long list of people that had real experiences that they experienced that similar that were similar to what we experienced. Yeah. So my wife, who is not on Facebook, never been on, never wants to be on, <laughs> she gets called into the office Dude. at Arapahoe County, right? And I'm the one that posted it. And you don't and even work in Arapahoe County. No, I had left Arapahoe County many years. She gets called into the office by her administrator and basically is dogged out and said, you know, that is just unacceptable that you would write something like that. When I was like, first of all, that's Jason's account. I'm not on Facebook. And guess we were hurt by that last yes. night. And basically my wife, she almost, short of being reprimanded for being, at the, I guess, at the, you know, speaking out about oppression. And, you know, 
The thing is, she wasn't even the one. So then it gets worse. They call up the Denver County <laughs> to, to the then acting division director. Sure. She calls me into the office and says, I'm glad that you said that. And I'm glad that you spoke up. That was a totally, totally irresponsible of them. And although I know that, you know, other counts may have different perspectives, I am truly sorry. Wow. And that's Melissa Carson that did that. Mm. Shout out to Melissa Carson. Mm. So, and then my boss at the time, her name was Lucia, and she totally understood what was going on. And I said, I mentioned that story because I, I, I had to mention it because if I didn't mention that story, I think that I would have turned into old pacified Jason. And I want to always now be as transparent and honest as I can be. Mm -hmm. And I no longer care about being popular. Yeah. I know you don't. I no longer care about being politically correct. All I want to try my best to do now is be authentic. Yes. So people don't have to experience the stuff that I've had to experience, that you had to experience. Absolutely. And that maybe if we can get into honest dialogue about stuff, yes. then perhaps we can see some changes. Now, I'm going to have to bring another thing up. Please. Now, I'm minding my own business at home, mm-hmm. uh, and I get, I see the news, and it talks about a judge in Arapahoe County. Okay, wait. Okay, wait, because we're going to dive into it. Before we do that, I love, I love, before we do I'm that, because it's, it's, it's coming. I'm cranking it up. Before, <laughs> before, <laughs> Before we do that, I want to do two things. So on this show, what we do is we like to give shout outs to the people that do amazing work. So I appreciate you giving shout outs. We don't use people by name that we dislike, but I am going to say shame on you, Children's Hospital. Your reputation is garbage when it comes to cultural respect. We tell our clients, if you give birth, don't go to Children's Hospital because of the the cultural incompetence and the cultural disrespect to families of color. We don't call people out by name, but as a whole community at Children's Hospital, get it together because we are coming for you so hard. There is documentation that shows that you have the highest number of calls about suspected child abuse on families of color more than any other, even though we know Colorado is not that diverse, but, but, but you got more calls against families of color in the child welfare system. So Children's Hospital in Aurora, Colorado, get it together because we see you. Yeah. So we don't mention people by names unless we're doing shout outs. So shout out to, and, and honestly, I shout out Denver County a lot. Yeah. Denver County has been my foundation. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a little bit biased against oh, a lot yeah. of other counties um, whenever it comes to Denver County because those are my people. Yeah. And I understand that we also have a lot of work to do. So mm-hmm. Denver County, we have a lot of work to do yeah. um, because ultimately every organization mm-hmm. under the MJ consultant firm mm-hmm. is considered racist if you do not have the same population mm-hmm. of relatives as we call everyone else called clients, but we call relatives. Mm-hmm. If you don't have that population mirrored yes. in the same percentage as the decision makers in a government organization, nonprofit and so forth, you are racist. Mm-hmm. So you are racist. Yeah. I want you to know that. But. The great thing about people of color is that we are, un- we're very forgiving. Oh, we're long very, suffering, forgiving. We're, for some um, reason, we oh. like to heal other communities that oppress us as we're healing ourselves. And I think because we know that the perpetrator, white America, is so hurt and distraught and they don't know how to get out of it. But we're so busy trying to survive and protect that we have to now save white America and save our community at the same time. And and we all do this by the hands of usually black and brown people. Um, so I say that to say that every white American is racist, but you can be in recovery, right? So you know how we have AA, Alcoholic Anonymous, we have NA, Narcotics Anonymous. Um, there's RA, there's Racist Anonymous. Um, and, and we welcome you to, to start on getting your first chip, but in order to do that, you know, that you have to admit that there's a problem, right? No matter what people say about racist America, that doesn't mean that we have to stay this way. We can heal, but you have to admit the harm and the damage that you've done before we get there. Um, so shout out to Denver County. You mentioned Denver County. I, I want to say something. Tell me. A few things. And, and I, I, I love what you just said back there about individuals looking in the mirror and making changes so that they can 
not be racist. Yes. That's freaking necessary, and it has to happen. Mm -hmm. And you say we shout out to cool people. I'll go give a shout out to somebody. Shout out to Mimi Schumerman. Okay. She is the deputy executive director, uh, and she oversees protection, uh, which is like the child welfare thing. But she invited her, well, I don't know if it was her or whomever. She allowed it to happen. She put that sign off on it. She invited us, to, me, uh, and a few others to have a conversation about race. Go ahead. And it was the biggest like I I didn't know that Zoom could well it was Google Meets uh, oh. whatever it is yeah. I didn't know that it could have that many people on there it was the most transparent thing I had never seen a kind of department have the the, the just the gall to have such a conversation sure. and I mean shout out to her shout out to uh, Dr. Dwanita uh, Mosby Tyler oh, uh, she's epic and she's doing a lot of work she did a lot of work with Arapaho she started it but you know I don't. I don't know what happened with that. We've got to get her back. Mm. But all, all I'm saying is, is that I want to make sure that people get their due yeah. that are doing the work that needs to be done, especially right. if they aren't black, because shout out to them, because yeah. they could easily sit back and not say anything. Absolutely. So I it's appreciate easier. it. I, I appreciate 100%, it. 100%. I 100% agree with you. Um, is yeah. it time now to talk about them? It's time. It's time. <laughs> uh, so going on. Okay. Arapaho. So here's the thing. Here's the thing about the different counties. There's different cultures yes. in each county mm -hmm. with the Department of Human Services, right? Like Denver's considered the liberal county. Yeah. Um, Denver is the county that, that's considered like we're more open-minded. And also, I used to think back in the day, Denver was the cheapest county. And and I said cheapest in this way. I said cheapest in the, they're just like, make it work. Make the families work. Because we know when these kids go to foster care, we're going to pay a lot of money. They're going to come back into the system. We're going to pay... Let's just support this family. Yeah. That's right. And back in the day, I'm like, Denver, y'all know y'all got more money that y'all can give to their family. But then I realized as I matured in this job, and I said, oh, because they've been there, done that. Mm -hmm. And they know that it's not working. Um, but then you have counties like, I don't know, Adams County. Adams County is the passive racist county. Um, Adams County is the one where I, when I first moved to Denver, Colorado, um, I always describe the South, like I can respect the racism in the South. It's like a wolf, right? A wolf is like, I am here to eat you. This is what I do. This is my job. You burn the crosses in the yard. You're like, that's it, right? But the passive racism in the North, like Colorado, is more like a fox. A fox will put his arm around you and you will have scratches on your back. And they'll be like, where did this come from? I feel like I can respect the racism of a cross burning mm. in my yard than the passive aggressive bullshit racism in Colorado. Wow. And that's what Adams County is to me. Mm. It is this don't call me racist because it makes it hurts my feelings. Yeah. But I am racist. Now, Arapahoe County is like, say it loud, we're racist and we're proud. <laughs> um, they are like fist up in the air, this is what we do. And I'm like, okay. I, I can respect that a little bit more, but what I don't respect is people saying that it does not exist. Wow. That is the most disrespectful thing that you can say is that this mm. racism does not exist. So, um... Is it, are we going there? Are we doing yeah, it? Are we doing yeah. it? Um, shout out to Arapahoe County for being openly racist. Mm. Shout out to you for mm. doing a great job of showing your colors. I have to say that, you know, one of, one of my biggest... I live in Arapahoe County. I am a taxpayer. Mm. I own my home in Arapahoe County. Mm. So I feel that I have the liberty to speak about it. Uh, oh, so it's you your know. community. And, you know, what most hurts me about Arapahoe County, it being the most diverse county in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about diverse, I'm speaking about race now. Yeah, no and socioeconomic status. And when I look at the leadership team at Arapahoe County, uh, across the board, not just child welfare, where are the black and brown LGBTQIA plus leaders? Mm. Where are they? Because it's just been my experience that decisions have been made about us without us. Absolutely. Does that make sense? 100. And I just, I want to challenge that system in particular because here I am minding my own business, mm. minding my own business, and I look at CNN, okay, CNN, I see a familiar name, we don't call him out by name, I got it, 
No, we calling this one out by name. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no, she's already famous. Infamous. <laughs> Infamous Judge Chase dropping the N bomb in front of black people, making disparaging comments about other judges, and feeling as though she can get away with it. Because she has been able to. And I want to know how does her mentality, when the camera's not on, how does that transcend to the decisions that she's made, the ter the termination of parental rights that she's done for countless families, the decisions that she's made to have families involved in child welfare in the first place, yeah. the decisions that she's made to create permanent decisions for kids to go and be outside of their home of origin, the decisions that she's made, not only when she was just in child welfare, but even prior to that. Because essentially what happened was the spotlight was turned on. Mm -hmm. And shout out to that person that stood up and said, this is inappropriate. And you have really crossed the line. And many people mm -hmm. have came before that. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's not just Judge Chase. And mind you, so Judge Chase, what was her name, Natalie? Or something like that? What's her name? Yeah. Uh, Judge Chase um, was, a, is, was a judge in the Arapahoe County Department of Human Services um, overseer for dependency and neglect cases. Yeah. And this is the way that I have to describe racism in the parallels between assault. So I don't just imagine and trigger warning a sexual assault because that's sometimes the only thing that white feminists in America understand is if it is relating to them. So let me help you get there. There is racism. There are people that have acts of racism. There are bystanders and there are anti-racists. The way that our kids get charged, our juvenile delinquents, if you're just present when something goes down, they're about to do time. We know this, right? So when you have someone that is actively racist, like Judge Chase, and then you have these racists, a lot of them guardian ad litem, some um, parents, counsel, attorney, lots of caseworkers. Those are the people that are the bystanders. They're just sitting there. So you are seeing and watching an assault happen. And you're just sitting there like, you are just as guilty as the racist. And then there's the allies, right? The allies see an assault happen and they take the perpetrator off the survivor. And they say, no, never again. And those are usually us, mm -hmm. right? We always have, we always see the assault happening. And we watch this community of people that are caseworkers with the Department of Human Services, Guardian at Lightham, shame on you, Arapahoe County, GALs. Some of you do a really good job, but others that have seen Just Chase do this, why does white America have to see someone gets the life choked out of them on national television? Or for some reason, hear the N-word and oh, maybe they are racist. You've been a bystander for years. You know she was racist. And shame on you for letting her not only perp, on the families, these survivors of the child welfare system, but letting her perp on the professionals, yeah. such as just black people that are trying to do the right thing. So, shame. I mean, I, I, I was shocked uh, because I knew that there were overt racism situations that were happening. Oh, I, yeah. I knew that. But I never thought that somebody would have the courage to call it out. And I think that, you know, this is a time when she just got caught. Yeah. What about all Years. She didn't the wake up time? one day and say, I think I'm going to be racist. Today. I think I'm just going to drop the M bomb today. Yeah, no, today she's been like saying a that. good day to drop the M bomb. And isn't her husband yeah. like a sheriff? I don't Rapa know about County? her husband. Her husband all is a sheriff in Arapahoe County. Oh. I'm just saying. I didn't know I'm that. I'm just saying. I didn't know that. I feel some type of way about that. that. I feel well, like she shouldn't even been in that position in the first place. Wow. Well, Shame on I everyone. I know that now. So, I mean, my thing is, is that. We have to move forward in a different direction. There's never been a woman of color, black woman of color, on the bench in Arapahoe County. Ooh. And you know somebody? Yeah. Well. <laughs> She's brand new, though. Who are you, who are you talking about? 
No, you, who? Melina Hernandez. Oh, wait. But she's not independency in the like. Shout out to Melina. You doing it? <laughs> she doing it. She killing it. I've talked about her before. I love her. But I just want now the repair. Repair is necessary. Grave repair. And I mean, maybe not even repair. Maybe we just need to throw the whole thing away and just go buy a new one. Let me tell you what my recommendation is. Let's hear. I need all white people to leave my community. We cannot heal with the perpetrator still in the home. White America is a domestic violence perpetrator. I cannot heal as my abuser just socked me in my eye. I'm visibly scorned, right? I'm mentally taken out. And then and then you're supposed to hand me an ice pack for my eye after you did that to me? I'm going to need you to do your treatment plan outside of my community. Mm. Every white American needs a treatment plan to be anti-racist. So you can become in recovery. So with this, because it, you're saying that we, everybody. Unless you're an ally. How do you, how, how do you know? Mm, let me tell you. If the, the ally. If the black community says you're an ally. <laughs> okay. We have to welcome you to come into our home. So here's the thing. I have a lot of allies that are white people that do phenomenal work. I have more I feel like more white allies um, that understand anti-blackness than black people mm. that understand anti-blackness in, in the child welfare because the child welfare system is this poison well. And as a professional in the system, it's the only water source that we have around. So we drink from it mm. and we drink from it and we drink from it and we poison ourselves with anti-blackness because it's the only thing that's around. We poison ourselves with anti-blackness. We do. We do, right? I've never heard. I've never heard that before. Now, I mean, that, we, I mean, but, but oh, so I've not. never heard of that. No, it's so powerful because sometimes, unfortunately, some of us hear the 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 ideas from our oppressors. Yes, and we, take it on we tend a... to just say, "Well, yeah, yeah, this is exactly who we are." Yeah, yeah, every terrible thing that you said. I it agree is 100% true. Domestic violence perpetrator. Mm. That's why it's a domestic violence perpetrator. What did you say? Hit me and hug me? All the time. Wow. All the time. Yeah. So we start to believe what our perpetrator tells us. Mm -hmm. You're worthless. You're nothing. Yeah. You can't do anything without me. I make all the money, right? Mm -hmm. Domestic violence perpetrator. We get gaslit all the time yeah. and we start believing it. Yeah. We start believing it. And I guess it's sad because I would be lying to you if, like, what is, what is that called? Is, is it called imposter syndrome? Yes. And I think that sometimes, like, man, I, you wonder, you know, you know, you get here, and then the doubt starts to creep in. But where does that doubt come from? Mm -hmm. Where? Our perpetrator. So if you, we have to have the ability to be proud of who we are, the ability to do what we're doing, what we're supposed to be doing, and the ability to call it out when we see it. And stop being all quiet about it. You know, I, I was talking to a colleague of mine. Um, shout out to Franco out in, in uh, L.A. Um, he runs this amazing organization um, that helps kids transition out of the foster care system. Actually, he don't help them transition. They're already out of the system. And he just helps do what the department should have done, which is give them skills in order to live. Mm -hmm. But he said, I said, you know, I'm starting this coalition where we call out people that uphold white supremacy. And he said... Okay. And I said, I live in Colorado, so a lot of the perpetrators are white professionals. And he said, we have all black professionals out here. What do you do for them? And I said, they still get called out because ultimately we're saying we're asking you to leave this community. You're doing more damage. Because when you put yourself above a community, you are no longer part of that community. Right. So we have to be all on the same level. Yes. And that's what anti-racism is, is. We are together in this. But as black professionals, and this is where a lot of people have used the term crabs in a bucket, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of crabs in a bucket is that when one crab is coming out, the other crabs pull them back down. But someone said this to me once, and I will never forget it. A bucket is not the crab's original environment. It's not. Wow. Right? Right? <laughs> right? It's not. Okay. It's not. Yeah. So... We are blaming the crabs in the bucket just because everyone's trying to survive. But who put them in the bucket? That's not even their environment. Right? That was a mic drop moment. Right? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> because, so, oh. so I, I like to have empathy for ourselves as a community and to understand that, yes, I have went into these meetings where black women have told me, shame on you, Adams County, where black women have told me, you know, MJ, you're talking a lot about racism. If you were nicer about it, maybe we'll actually be open to listening. And this was literally like not even a month ago. And I said, I am not going to nicely ask my abuser, which is white supremacy, to get their knee off my neck. I am not. Wow. And or I'm could you so- use the other knee? Because maybe that one would feel better. Okay. Ooh, and wow. I said, so, so a lot of people say, and I was so angry and so hurt because she's a black woman. Mm-hmm. And she's coming after me, another black woman, in front of all these white people. What do they call it? The sunken place? Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh no no no. There's a lot of people that are there. Uh-huh. There's a lot and, and, and at first I was so offended. And then I, the first thing that came to mind was crabs in a bucket. And then I thought, she's not supposed to be in the bucket. No. And I'm sorry that someone put her there. I guess what I want to say to this is is that I started with this and I guess we'll end with this. You are on the freeway. And it is necessary for all of us that really care about true reform to be right there in the same car with you Mm -hmm. or in the same bus with you or on the same train, wherever it is, whatever your mode of transportation is, we want, we need to be right there with you because you're the one that's going to, you along with your followers, i.e. Jason and a few others that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm are going to be right there with you to support you to the end. I appreciate and that. it's sometimes uh, bleeding while bleeding. Yeah. And I imagine, I t- Sarah, you have like this like this target. And to say the things that you've said, it takes a courageous human to believe it, to say it, and to bring it to action. Now, I'm going to flip the ta- I'm gonna flip the table. You've got something coming up here soon in the Mile High City. And you didn't ask me to do this, but I need you to tell the viewers what's about to happen. So um, this actually may, this may play after the protest, but here's the thing about it. So the MJ Consultant Front is putting on this national protest, and we want it to occur every year in every state. Um, And we're protesting here against systemic racism in the child welfare system. And I thought it was so beautiful to have you be a part of this in this conversation is because the population that you work with is the homeless population. We know that 36% of all children in the foster care system that age out of the system will be homeless within the first 18 months. This is what we know. In some states, it's actually higher percentage, right? But as a national level. And we are shining a light on all the white saviors out there that are trying to save the children, but you don't think about their community. You don't think about their families and you don't think about the population such as the homeless community. So if you are out here saying, I am a social worker, what are you doing to help the homeless community? How are you advocating for the homeless community? Because mind you, they were children too, right? Um, They deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. And we need to focus on that and we need to highlight that so with our protest because you know black people we can't never get together without a cookout right like we just i don't even know, i don't even know if that's in our dna but we are protesting here this is june 5th here um but for next year in 2022 oh my god are we in Jesus. next year we want to have a protest every year on the first saturday of june because it is to me june is like our black history month we've been celebrating juneteenth before it got put on the map during COVID year of 2020. Juneteenth has always been a thing. White people, you're welcome. We're giving you an extra holiday. Um, but but we want to celebrate. And what we're doing is we're marching against systemic racism in the child welfare system. We're having a cookout barbecue here um, at the park, community, um, families, and so forth. And we're going to cook to feed. We want to feed at a minimum 500 people. And we're taking all of that food, the barbecue, potato salad, and so forth. And we're going to take it to um, the homeless community and feed our community because the homeless population is an extension of the child welfare system. Um, And this is something that we know. So, so even though this may play a little bit after we want to have this every year and please do um, check out our website at the MJ consulting Denver um, because we have an entire link that's dedicated to the protest and we want to start planning for next year's protest. 
So, Jason, it's been a pleasure. It's Look, always a pleasure to have you. I, you know, the last thing I got to say is that our words have to become deeds that meet the needs of our people. That came from Joseph Lowry. He said that Shut at up. Coretta Scott King's funeral uh, in Atlanta, mm-hmm. and it forever replays in my mind because say it's that one again. thing. Say our that words again. have to become deeds that meet the needs of mm-hmm. our people, so and powerful. we can say all of this stuff, mm-hmm. but we had but it's power in action. Absolutely, and I think that what you represent is a word in action, and I think that the things that you've spoken about today, I can't wait to be down there at that cookout. I can't wait to be down there to get my, I have all my little, get my steps. Ah. I'll be walking down to the park and mm-hmm. I can't wait to like just get back into service and catering to people. And the last thing I want to say is I I think that my son Ellington is the most handsome uh, human in the world. And I wonder though, what's going to happen when he grows up and he's no longer viewed as being adorable? What's going to happen when his uh, his situation uh, starts to uh, look at be- to become viewed as a hindrance from others. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen if he happens to be at a stoplight and he can't control his emotions and someone makes a flawed decision of taking my son's life? What is going to happen if he's misunderstood? What's going to happen? And the reason why I no longer feel unafraid to speak out and speak up about things is because I don't want me and Shanika or anybody that loves us, any of our friends and family to ever get that phone call from us Mm -hmm. because our son was involved in something that could have been totally avoided or I could have been told that I am involved in something that could have been avoided or she is involved or any of us, you know, I don't want to be on a t-shirt. I don't want my son to be on a t-shirt. I don't want you to be on a t-shirt. And the work that we are about to embark upon, that we've been trying to do, that you've been doing for years, you used to it. You know, (laughs) we're just getting into it. You used to it. But the work is so powerful because we have to eliminate these barriers. And when you said get out of the community, basically what that means is get out of the community, get yourself together, yes. and then if you can get yourself back in together, get yourself together. We welcome Come on you. Back. We welcome like you. Like they say, like my old church, we welcome you to yeah. St. Luke. We welcome. Shout out to St. Luke. And, uh, <laughs> but I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, shout out to those allies, though. Yes. Because I need to say yes. that. Because yes. there are some people that, I mean. They've been down for the cause since yeah. 1992. <laughs> Probably before that. <laughs> really been down with the cops. Like was like, time. Yeah, I mean, it's down. Yeah, but I mean, I just, I guess, I know we're wrapping it up, but I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to put a picture on Facebook with me and you. And <laughs> In this I'm together. Just excited. I'm, I'm just excited, and I look forward to the sequel. Yes, yes. Yeah. We're going to have Jason come back, and we're going to have a conversation with them. Um, we want to welcome especially other Black professionals. Um, because there's a lot of black professionals in the child welfare system that aren't able to speak freely. Um, we see you and we hear you. I may call you out gently, but understand that I, it's all out of love, um, because it's my community. It's your community. And we have to realize that we're not separate from them, no matter what degrees that we have on our walls that tell us that we're better than we're not, we're not. So thank you. Thanks for watching. And don't forget to tune in next week, Wednesday, 12 p.m. Mountain Time, for a live debrief with our special guest. We look forward to having you join the conversation.